Welcome back to Developing the Leader Within podcast. Today, we are celebrating the Army's 247th birthday, a day early, but that's okay. Hua to all my Army brothers and sisters. And to celebrate, I have SEAC retired John Wayne Troxel with me. He's the owner and founder of PME Heart Consulting, LLC. He has served over 37 years in the United States the Army, culminating as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which made him the senior non-commissioned officer in the United States military. His company provides leadership and human performance solutions to optimize organizational excellence. And he serves as a consultant, strategic advisor, and brand ambassador for nine different corporations. That is quite a list, John. Welcome to the show. Enrique, thank you, brother. It's uh, an honor to be here and uh, spend some time with you here on air. Oh, I love it. Look, uh, uh, folks, we, we got him mid trip. He's so busy and he took out time for DTLW podcast. So I am so grateful, John, for you, uh, your service. We were speaking before uh, and all that you've done uh, post service, which is amazing. Uh, folks, today we're going to be talking about leadership and service. Uh, but before we get into that, John, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, so Enrique, I you know, I grew up in uh, a town in Iowa called Davenport, Iowa, Quad Cities, USA. And, uh, you know, I joined the Army when I was 18 years old. And uh, as you said, served over 37 years. Um, and, you know, when I served in the military, I just tried to be the best soldier I could be. And shortly after I got into service, I met a young uh, lady down in uh, El Paso, Texas, uh, by the name of Sandra Jimenez, that I immediately fell in love with, and we got married in September of 83, and we've been married for 39 years come this September, and, um, and she's been with me throughout my journey, both uh, in the military and after, you know, outside the uniform now and everything, and I think uh, the one thing I want people to, to understand is even as a leader and even as somebody culminating as the senior enlisted person in the Department of Defense, uh, I tried to make sure that my legacy, you know, if we can control our own legacy, that I, I was hoping people would think of me as a good teammate. And, you know, and that means as a leader, you got to humble yourself a little bit, but also meaning that uh, you're not afraid to go down to the lowest levels to learn from, you know, maybe a third class petty officer or a specialist or somebody like that. So I've always been that kind of person that, you know, was humble and, uh, and was genuine, transparent, and tried to lead by example in everything I did. And so uh, when I retired and turned over the position to uh, CZ Colon Lopez, uh, Air Force, who's the current SEAC, um, I wanted to continue to get after it in the corporate world in two ways. One, I wanted to give back to the institution that known as the United States military that gave me so much. So I choose to be an enabler uh, as a retiree and not an agitator that uh, you find some of our brothers and sisters who are retired will do. And, uh, and so I, I belong to seven different foundations. And, uh, and then I wanted to you know, compete in the corporate world. So I started my own consulting business and now I'm consulting for nine different organizations, uh, whether it's in veteran support or in fitness, nutrition, um, stuff like that. And that's what I'm doing now. And uh, so um, enjoying life, being able to give back, being able to take care of my family and also, uh, just uh, continuing to live life to the fullest every day. So that's kind of who I am and what I am. And, uh, and I'm just excited to be here today. Yeah, and it's amazing. Uh, not only your trajectory in the military and culminating as the top senior uh, enlisted for all forces, which is, uh, it's just astounding. Uh, so congratulations on that. I, I was telling you before, it's a, it's a feat that is seldom had. You just mentioned that um, you know, it's turned over to the Air Force hands. And I, I love how that position does uh, kind of rotate. Um, and I was fortunate to meet several of the SEACs uh, while I was a senior enlisted over in Hawaii. 
Um, yeah. and, I, I, and, and so I, I'm so thankful for all that you guys have done. Now there's a so little, in, yeah, yeah. Ricky, if I can, it, the position doesn't rotate. It is a nominative. So people compete for the job. So the first SEAC was army Joe Ganey. And, uh, and he got selected amongst a number of senior enlisted from all the services, the same with Brian Battaglia, a Marine at number two. And then I competed, uh, the finalists were a Navy guy and an Air Force guy and me and General Dunford selected me. And, uh, and, and the same with uh, SEAC number four, General Milley came down to three finalists and uh, he chose CZ, uh, the Air Force guy. So it's, uh, it's not a rotation basis per se. Um, although, you know, um, the chairman does look at it like, hey, have we given all the services an opportunity but I think uh, uh, in the end, when you get to that level, even if you're a finalist and you don't make it, um, you're still at the top tier and everything. So, yeah. Absolutely not. Thank you for clearing that. I was meaning more in the sense that it's not any a fixed branch that's represented. Right. But, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, if you get to compete, <laughs> At that level, I think you've won, <laughs> whether you won or not, right? Whether you got the yeah, position yeah, yeah. to uh, the opportunity to serve or not, uh, which is wonderful. You know, I, I did meet Battaglia in Hawaii. I, I've spoken with CZ a couple of times. Hopefully he'll be on the show. Uh, and I do know that Battaglia will be with me to celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. So awesome. um, I, I try to give all the CX an opportunity at the table. So thank you for all that. Now there's something before we get into leadership and service here, because we were chatting a little bit, uh, uh, about, you know, mafia and, you know, there's a <laughs> couple of mafia things that, <laughs> that seemingly happen in the military. Sometimes you're like, Hey, how, how does that work? But you're actually a mafia buff. Uh, at, you, you're up there in New York, uh, having a good old time. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what intrigued you into that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly uh, throughout my career, you know, I've constantly studied uh, organizations and, and how, you know, hierarchy and everything. But I was just at a young age, I was intrigued, you know, not that I wanted to be a mafioso or anything, you know, but I was just intrigued about this covert kind of organization and how they built this you know criminal enterprise and everything and uh and then i think the vast majority of americans are sopranos fans you know from the uh, series the sopranos or boardwalk empire or something like that obviously the movies the godfather casino and things goodfellas and things like that and so i've just always been a intrigued about people that go into that lifestyle and you know and generally there's only two ways you get out of it either you end up in jail or you end up in the cemetery you know and and some guys you know get very wealthy but they become the richest people in the cemetery you know so um some people may not know that uh, I've been I'm a huge fan of you know the mafia I'm just intrigued by it some of my close friends uh, know it so here I am in New York City now doing business. And uh, last night uh, we went down to Little Italy uh, with friends, my wife and some friends, and we ate at a Italian restaurant. So while we're sitting there in this restaurant, Danico's, oh, by the way, pictures on the wall of the restaurant of some of the stars of the Sopranos who have come in there to eat. I just Googled Umberto's Clam House and found out it was 500 feet away from the restaurant we were in. And in 1972, Two, Umberto's Clam House got famous because a, a well-known mobster, Crazy Joe Gallo, on his 43rd birthday got gunned down in the restaurant. Now, I understand, you know, uh, the next building over was that Umberto's, and they since have moved about 50 feet to another building. But so I said, hey, I want to go see Umberto's, you know, and so uh, we went and saw the sign. My wife took a picture, and then I said, okay, the king of Mulberry Street was John Gotti. And, uh, and uh, you know, the Hollywood Don, the Teflon Don, and, and I Googled the Ravenite Social Club, which was his clubhouse, and it was right down the road on Mulberry Street, too. So we walked down there. It's now an apartment complex. 
And uh, the apartment next door is where a elderly lady lived that John Gotti was paying rent for. And that's where he would have his high level meetings with Sammy the Bull and everything. So we went down there, took pictures. I kind of, you know, explained to our friends, you know, what the significance of. And then a gentleman that lived in uh, the, the, the old Ravenite, now the Farber complex, complex, walked out. He saw us there and he said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm not John Gotti. He says, you know, so. But uh, so, yeah, that that's uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, maybe a not so well known fact about me. And, uh, and uh, but those that are in my inner circle, they know it well. And we we, you know, throw Sopranos quips back and forth to each other all the time. So. Well, thank you for letting us into your inner circle for a tidbit, uh, <laughs> folks. It, it, it's it's amazing because when we talk about leadership, uh, even in a clandestine type, uh, you know, behind the scenes type of organization, they still require some service, right? You still have to have a servant mentality to, Absolutely. to, to, to float in that family type of environment, because they, if one thing we know is that, Hey, you become a family. I'm talking about, you become a family, right? Uh, and there's a price for cutting, <laughs> cutting ties for that family. You just mentioned it, but as we're talking about the subject of leadership and service, um, and, and your reflection on your time in service, what was, or what are some of the biggest changes that you have seen in the services since you've been in the office? So, uh, you know, I spent 37 years, 10 months, 29 days in the United States military. And it's never been a perfect organization or institution. It's never going to be perfect. But it has, has been and will always be the best representation of what the United States of America should be. It's a meritocracy. Um, where you, if you come in and apply yourself, you can grow and develop and, and you can become somebody that you didn't think you could be, you could reach your untapped potential. And the changes I've seen, it, and you know, leadership is an art, Enrique, and we always have to remember that, that leaders at all levels, I don't care if it's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the SEAC, all the way down to the lowest first line leader or whatever it is, to be effective, you have to balance things uh, in regards to your troops, which means things like accountability and empathy. There has to be a balance there, you know, and if, and if there's an over accountable and uh, unempathetic kind of approach by a leader, they're probably going to have challenges and then vice versa. If it's the other way, another way it could be said is a, said is a balance between discipline and compassion. And it's got to be a balance. And that's why leadership is an art. But I see um, what concerns me about the fourth. First of all, what I love that we're doing now is we are really getting after things and looking internally within the military to make sure that we have uh, diversity, that we are being inclusive, and that uh, there's some equity going on to make sure that the military stays a representation of what the United States of America is. So I absolutely applaud that. But I think there are some leaders out there that think that means that you have to have an imbalance and you have to be very empathetic and not as accountable. To the point that I've seen on social media, senior lists, listed leaders having discussions in these forums talking about Hey, I'm, let's go to the chow hall today and let's not worry about, you know, making on the spot corrections. Let's just go visit the troops. Well, to me, that means today I'm not going to enforce anything. But tomorrow, a different day, I am going to enforce something. And this is how troops get confused. But this is also how they get disenchanted with service in the military because they have leaders that have that are double standard in their approach. And so I think as a leader, you have to be transparent in everything you do. You have to be genuine in your approach and lead by example in everything you do. And I think uh, what I'm seeing, you know, to a certain extent now with all the goodness that's going on to get after to make sure that the United States military continues to represent, uh, you know, what the United States of America is, which is a melting pot, um, I get concerned that leaders are 
now, you know, it's, it's uh, being a little bit more hands off, a little bit more, maybe lack of a better word, softer in their approach. And I think when you belong to an institution that is responsible for fighting and winning our nation's wars and preserving peace and democracy and our freedom and our way of life, um, and it's brutal and unforgiving, regardless if uh, you know, you're fighting on the ground in, in places like the Middle East, or if you're doing freedom of navigation stuff in the South China Sea, or flying combat missions you know, um, in Syria or places like that, we have to remember what we're here for. And in the end, that's what it's got to be about, is our responsibility to the American people to preserve that peace uh, that freedom, that democracy in our way of life. And so I see leaders that try to have this imbalance. And when you have that imbalance, your effectiveness will get uh, hurt and your reputation can get tarnished in terms of what you are as a leader. We don't want toxic leaders out there, but we don't want leaders that are going to create an environment that is so permissive that the men and women of the organization get a, a sense of entitlement and when that entitlement, it, it doesn't present itself, that they don't know how to deal with that adversity. That's why, as I say again, leadership is an art and we got to get after that balance between compassion, discipline and empathy and accountability. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I, I said once uh, that don't let your leadership be a coin toss. Right. You, you can't you can't just flip a coin and say, oh, I'm going to be this way today. I'm going to be that way tomorrow. You will definitely create a environment of. Well, to just to say of insecurity, you Absolutely. your people will not be secure. Um, and in trying to deal with the armed forces or the collective of people that are responsible for what you just said, winning the nation's wars, you have to be careful that the balance is kept because disenchanted and, and, uh, uh, servicemen and women, it's not a good thing. Uh, yeah. but also, uh, you know, beat down, uh, men and women of armed forces is, is never a good thing as well. Um, so yes, I, I agree with your, with your philosophy on balance because there truly is an art form to leadership. And if there's any place where we foster that is in the military. Now, I, I, from all your time uh, in service and, and now in the corporate where, where you're killing it, by the way, uh, what's, it, what's important for leaders or why is it important for leaders to have a heart for service? Because it, uh, I, I feel there's a requirement. Yeah. So Enrique, I, 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 there's two things I always tell leaders uh, during my leadership seminars and everything. Uh, first of all, you have to have the ability as a leader to fire people up in 60 seconds or less. If someone hands you a mic and says you got 60 seconds, then you better be able to fire them up in a hurry. And second of all, when you walk into a room, people's eyes should light up. And it could be for various reasons. They, you know, here he is. He's going to you know, we're going to do great stuff today that the leader's here, or it could be, all right, the leader's here. And if somebody's half stepping here, I don't want to miss it when that butt chewing happens, you know? So, you know, and I'm not saying you have to be a nice person, but the room has to light up when you come in and people know it's going to be about action and it's going to be about getting after the mission and it's going to be about building the team. And in terms of how you talk to people, you know, you got 60 seconds or, or less. If you can't do it, then you're going to lose some people. You know, I was just, uh, you know, a couple of days ago was in Scotland. And uh, I was there with the U.S. Space Command senior enlisted leader, uh, Master Gunnery Sergeant Scott Stalker, Marine. And the uh, soldiers, uh, the, the soldiers charity of the United Kingdom uh, asked both Scott and I to speak. And there was two other gentlemen uh, from the UK that were speaking. And they told us, you got one minute. All right. And that's it. So I'm talking, we're, Scott and I are talking to about a thousand people, you know, and, 
And so having done this multiple sets and reps of knowing how to fire people up, you know, he got up there and the first thing he said is, hey, look, you know, I'm the guy in charge of U.S. Space Command, you know, and I've never walked on space, but I know some of these mountains out here will feel like I'm walking in space, you know, and everything. So he hit it with a line that immediately got the people, you know, grinning and everything. And I got up there and talked about, hey, this is my third time doing the yomp. The first two times I was in uniform as the SEAC and I had to behave myself. I said, this time I'm retired and I'm looking for any and all scotch whiskey along this 23 mile route. So if anybody's got some, hook me up, you know. So the ability of a leader to put the audience at ease, whether it's those that you um, are in your direct uh, span of control, or if you're in a speaking engagement or whatever it is, um, the leader has to be able to do that. And that's why I always say when 60 seconds or less, you've got to be able to fire your audience up. And then when you walk into a room, that means that uh, it, people's eyes light up and everything. And this goes back to being transparent in everything you do, um, being genuine in your approach. Don't try to use smoke and mirrors and don't try to virtue signal to the troops or genuflect, be you. And then in the end, the key component is leading by example in everything you do in word and deed, showing the men and women in your span of control what right looks like through your daily actions and what you say. So that's kind of, I think, the most important thing out of it all is, is just being that genuine, transparent kind of leader. And absolutely. Now, you know, I, I love that you could do that in 60 seconds. Yeah, you one minute is, is not a lot of time and you got to have yeah. something in your toolbox to be able to throw out there, but not only just to get them riled up, get it, get them anticipating, you know, uh, more and saying, man, yeah, that was the best 60 seconds. I want more of that, uh, wonderful, uh, share there of how that, uh, whole situation played out now in success, as far as leadership, uh, the ability to be a servant has mm -hmm. a play in how successful you are. Um, you can't be, as, as you alluded to, you, you, you just can't be one way and not the other or be able to uh, multi uh, facet your leadership because every situation is not the same, but what does, and what role does a servant's heart have in a leader's ability to succeed? I think it is most critical attribute a leader ha has to have is being a servant leader. It's got to be about service to others and service to the men and women within your span of control. Um, the, the minute a leader becomes self-serving and it's about them, uh, they are done as a leader and they are going to, especially with this generation as smart as these young men and women are that are in the military now, you're going to lose them in a heartbeat, you know, if it's about you and not them, um, you know, and so I think there's a, a kind of a uh, scale that a leader has to operate on in terms of service. Um, you want them to be humble uh, in everything they do, you know, and, but, and you want them to be confident as a leader, displaying confidence in what they're doing through their actions and everything. But you don't want them to be overconfident or arrogant or narcissist, because, again, you're going to lose the troops, as you mentioned. But then on the other side, being humble means you don't have to be self-loathing, OK? You, the leader shouldn't be telling the troops, hey, I'm sorry that I'm an E9 and you're an E4, and I wish that you, you could live in my house and I could live in, in your trailer park off post or whatever. Service in the military you know, is based on a meritocracy. And when I was a young E2 and E3, I lived in a trailer park, okay? And I knew that if I wanted to be able to live in a house like the command chief or the master chief or the sergeant major were living in, then I had to put my time in. And I had to continue to get after things that would make me competitive. And then I would look at you know, senior leaders like you or others. And I would say, how do I get to where you're at? Deliver me a career path that would get me there. And I think when you get to a certain level, 
Um, that's what servant leadership is all about. And especially as the Sea Act, that was what it was all about is giving back to the force. And so to me, that meant that I had to travel around the world and I traveled about 270 days out of the year armed with the chairman's priorities and the secretary of defense's priorities and our national military and defense strategies. And I would deliver the why to the troops. And, and then I would, while I was delivering the why, I would gain the pulse of the force to give back to the leadership in the Pentagon and the administration. So I think being a servant leader means you understand how to get after what your bosses expect out of you. But more importantly, it's what are you doing to, uh, so that the troops understand what your role is and what you're doing. Now, I will tell you, I've gone to certain places and you being a Navy guy, you can appreciate this gotten on certain ships and uh and for guys and gals that have, were supposed to only be on deployment for seven months and all of a sudden hey the three days before they are supposed to go home you're staying out there for nine months now and so i felt it important that i would go to you know an aircraft carrier or something like that to brief those sailors um on what the on what the why you know and I think, you know, Enrique, anybody that served in the military knows that, you know, you're going to have harsh living conditions. You are going to deal with long days and, and not enough sleep. You're going to deal with a lot of cold chow and stuff like that. But in the end, I know this about the American uh, service member, is that if they know why they're doing what, whatever mission they're doing and wherever they're at and how long they're going to be doing it for, and, you know, you would take care of the basics, like letting them talk to their and communicate with their families back home and everything, regardless of how bad it sucks, they'll get after it and they will complete the mission in a high fashion because they know why they're doing it. Yeah. And I, I tell you once, um, and, and yes, I, I love the fact that you took the time out uh, to explain the why the why is a huge contributor to the effectiveness of missions. And there was, they, there were years that I never got the why right? <laughs> it was just that time. It, yeah. it was the life that we were living and, and the decade that we were living in. Uh, but as I grew up as a leader, I realized the importance of the why. And I always, uh, and I remember, always remember this story. I, I was at the senior enlisted Academy going through uh, you know, as a, as an E seven, which was the first for my community got there and, uh, the country brief, right. We all get a country brief and we have to stand in front and, and, and teach that or, or brief that. And I chose a, a mission, uh, you know, area that I knew I was going to just so I can get a heads up, but the amount of why through that, uh, research and diving into the things, especially taking the strategy, right? The defense strategy for the nation into account, um, gave me so many whys to take back. And when I returned and I started sharing these whys that came about this brief, um, it was easy to say we're leaving in two hours. It was, you know, if we, if I had to say we're leaving in two hours, that why facilitated a very easy transition on a C-130 and across the globe, right? So I yeah. believe in that. And it was, and it was uh, amazing uh, when we could do that. Now, uh, there are a lot of leaders out there trying, you know, listening to this, trying to figure out some things. So what top tips would you give leaders regarding uh, servanthood? So I think one of the key things is, um, and I'll just give you some tips that I use as the Sea Act. I'm going to visit troops that I've never met before, you know. But one thing I that one thing you know we talk all the time that the character of conflict will continue to evolve, you know. And now we've got cyber, we've got space, the nuclear domain has reemerged and stuff like that. But will what will remain constant through any kind of change? is that the troops will continue, as I say it, Joe will continue to be Joe. 
And Joe will make the same mistakes that you and I made when we were youngsters and, and will do the same kind of things that you and I tried to do, you know, in terms of, you know, drinking all the alcohol out of the local pubs and, and chasing all the girls and everything and, and trying to sneak them into the barracks or dormitories or stuff like that. That's just the nature of being a young man or woman, you know, with now serving your nation and everything. And, you know, so I always tried to be a leader that focused on what are the youngsters value. And if you see a young troop that has, for, I'll give you an example, sleeve tattoos, you know, some, some leaders will frown upon that. We have service regulations that govern tattoos and everything. But I would see a troop of sleeve tattoos. And to me, that means they value having these tattoos and everything. And they, they are, for whatever reason, uh, they're addicted to it. So when I would come up and meet service members and I would see something like that, I would say, hey, what's going on there, youngster? How you doing? I said, how's the tattoo parley? You holding it down, man? <laughs> you know, and everything. I would try to ease any kind of tension that might be associated with that. And then I would also look at things that I knew service members would be proud of, like, you know, big muscular kind of men and women, you know, so they take pride in going into the gym or anything. And I would kind of use the same thing. I would say, hey, what's going on there? You know, how's the gym? You holding it down? I said, you're policing up them 100 pound dumbbells, right? So somebody like me don't stumble over that shit when I come into the gym and everything, you know, but knowing that they value their health, they value their fitness, things like that. So how do I put them at ease? Here's the C Act talking to an E4. How do I put them at ease like that? And I think as a leader, that comes from the sets and reps of interaction with troops every day. And so uh, I, I just think there is, you can never go wrong with just being genuine you know, and, and being you every day, because, you know, that being genuine and being transparent and everything you do. I will tell you, Enrique, when I was the SEAC, this is how transparent I was. I had my staff open my mail when it came in, because I had no skeletons in my closet. You know, I've been married to the same woman, you know, now for almost 39 years, and um, I don't have any skeletons in my closet. And so I was that comfortable with people opening my mail, you know? So I think that, that being genuine, being transparent are the key tips that I would ha have for leaders. And stop trying to overanalyze on what you should be. You don't need to be self-loathing for your troops to respect you. And don't try to virtue signal and think that if I say something that is... Um, that they're hoping that I will say that I will be that much more of an effective leader. No, that that's how you get into these situations that you described, you know, dis, dis, or disenfranchised and, or disenchanted and stuff like that. Just be yourself. And, and then there is no substitute for eyeball to eyeball, kneecap to kneecap kind of conversations. And I see too many leaders trying to use text message. Don't get me wrong. There's a time and place to use text and stuff like that, but there's no substitute for looking someone in the eye and having real conversations. And, and then as a leader, being open to, you know, um, feedback from your, the men and women you lead. And I'll give you an example. You know, the best thing I think is these 360 degree feedbacks where you would have seniors kind of tell you how you're doing. You would have peers tell you how you're doing. Then you would have subordinates. And I don't care how many general officers I've worked for, they never spoke as eloquently as some young E5 that you now has a platform to tell me what they think about me as a leader, you know? And I think as a leader, you have to take that with a grain of salt. If somebody, if you ask somebody, hey, what do you think of me as a leader and everything? And excuse my language, if they say, well, I think you're an asshole. Well, you shouldn't attack them because they gave you a candid opinion of what they think of you. What you should be doing is two things. One, let's have a conversation on why you think that and, and then do a self-reflection as a leader to say, how do I fix this so this person doesn't uh, feel this way, you know? And, but too many times leaders are too proud uh, that when somebody tells them something like that, that they attack the person for giving them what they wanted, unfiltered feedback, you know? And that's, 
another thing that adds to the challenges we have in the force. Well, I definitely love 360 feedback. I tell you that <laughs> everybody grows when that happens mm -hmm. correctly, right? When it happens correctly and a leader is not taken aback by some kind of feedback that maybe doesn't rub them the right way. But, uh, you know, everybody wins because the subordinate, the subordinates get to express themselves freely. Mm -hmm. The peers get to tell you candidly, Hey, you know, this is going on and, and your superiors get to tell you, Hey, this is the reflection we get up here. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's the matter of how do you want to be reflected at all three levels as a leader? Uh, and that should be the key. Great tips there. Uh, Siak, I, I really appreciate all that we've spoken about. Now, if somebody listening to this episode wanted to get a hold of you, maybe uh, look at your uh, and participate in your social media, uh, how would they do that? So I have a website, pmehard.com. Uh, you can go to my website and see everything I'm doing. You can find me on Facebook, uh, the eTool Nation uh, page on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram and uh, Twitter as well, LinkedIn. You just reach out to me. And if uh, people really want to get a hold of me, email address john.troxel at iCloud.com. Absolutely, folks. Uh, I'm going to have that as part of the show notes and the video so you can get a hold of uh, SEAC, John, here. He has not only served, uh, you know, good 37 plus years in the military, but he's doing. Uh, similar things and even more important things now that he's in on the other side of service. And so we thank you for all of that, uh, John. We really appreciate what you've done so far and what you will continue to do. Uh, give our best to your family. A and folks, today's episode is sponsored by Triad Leadership Solutions. Uh, and if you've enjoyed this episode and learned something interesting about the topic covered today, Make sure to subscribe and let us know by leaving a comment right now. We're always looking for new ideas and guests that we can add to our show. So if you know someone or have a topic that you would like discussed or featured on the podcast, we'd love to hear about it by emailing us at triadleadershipsolutions at gmail.com. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode where we dissect leadership from another angle. And as we like to end this show, Happy birthday, Army. Success to you. Thanks, Enrique. I appreciate it. It's been an honor to be here, brother.